precious name and I had a little talk with Jim before service earlier today and he was asking me how did I uh, end up meeting my wife and moving down here and I said well uh, I'd be honest with you I kind of had given up on dating and then I was uh, like a blind date situation and my roommate introduced me and I was like oh we're going on a blind date and then <laughs> it ends up being this fantastic woman who helps lead me to faith later in life and in a uh, precious name God gives us what we need when we need it, even before we know it. And that's uh, what Jim mentioned. He goes, yeah, sometimes God does that. And of course, he does that a lot of the time. So grateful for that. Um, Jesus' precious name. So what are we talking about for a sermon message this morning? A history of keeping power. A history of keeping power. And the source scripture is Matthew 2.16. It'll be familiar when I get to the point where I can read it. But it's the concept of the elite and the powerful that's always fascinated me. Right? And we, we are, many people are fascinated with the rich and elite. Like we watch them drive their sports cars and live in their mansions. And uh, some of the younger folks watch it on MTV. And we see these houses and these lifestyles. And it's just the idea that there is the subsection of the population in almost every country that can literally buy their way out of trouble or use their status to sway a group of people to side with them based on maybe just a Facebook post or a Twitter post or something they say over lunch or coffee. And we saw this depicted clearly in a recently streamed television series, I think it was Netflix, it was called Dope Sick. You ever heard of this? Dope as in the, the opioid drug which documented some real-life accounts of large pharmaceutical companies manipulating their way out of legal trouble again and again, right? So these poor uh, patients would become addicted to opioids and painkillers, and then uh, when a court case would finally come to be, the head of the pharmaceutical corporation would just send somebody to pay them off or talk to them, and they were out of trouble. And so this drama shows the head of the family doing this over and over again. And, uh, you know, not all people in power are corrupt. Surely that's true. In the Bible, we have the account, for example, of King David. Very, very powerful. Okay? King from nothing to great power. And in several areas, the Bible refers to David as God's anointed leader. A man after God's own heart. But by and large, I think it is safe to be kind of skeptical regarding the super elite. Right? And so enter in the case of the Herod family in the New Testament. Uh, all I have to do for some of you, uh, if you study the Bible, is say the name Herod, and it's like, ooh, oh, right? And so many in his family line were put into positions of power throughout the history of the Bible, and they wielded that power with force and malicious intent. They often struggled to keep power, for the Roman government was the true authority in most of the first century, uh, first century Middle Eastern provinces. So uh, King Herod, as we first meet him in the New Testament, is sometimes referred to as a client king. A client king. Um, so everything's okay, uh, Herod, as long as you don't go against the Roman government or as long as your people don't get a little bit too rowdy and start to rise up and cause a ruckus. Okay, we'll let you be king, even though the Roman government is really king. Okay, that was kind of the idea. And so we remember the story about Herod seeking to kill the infant Jesus shortly after learning that a prophet had been born. This attempt to stay in power, it affects all the land and almost everyone in it. And this awful strategy shows up nowadays every once in a while also. So here is Matthew 2.16. We'll look at it together. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, because they tricked him, it's a great story. If you don't remember it, go back and read it. He was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Sounds like a great guy, doesn't it? Goodness. So as evidence from scriptures, Herod wasn't a good guy. Imagine this type of evil sounding like a good idea to someone. He was willing to use his power in his office to go after children, to go after Jesus, all in the attempt to stay in power. And I wish I could say, like I said, it doesn't go on today, but I believe it still does. If we look back at recent historical events, uh, the Holocaust, years later, the Civil War in Rwanda, uh, in Rwanda, Bands of roving, militia soldiers would go from village to village with machetes, okay? And I won't go into any further details, but there's a student in one of my classes who's from Rwanda, okay? So he knows a little bit more about what happened uh, years ago. And so people can be capable of great love and goodness at times, 
and then great cruelty when affected and afflicted by sin. So we fast forward a bit to another Herod during the time of the apostles, Herod Agrippa I, different person, same family line. Scripture shows that this man was quite corrupt. In fact, in Acts 12, it paints a picture of him murdering James, son of Zebedee, in order to please the Jewish elites. They didn't like him. So Agrippa is also credited with imprisoning Peter prior to that miraculous angelic escape that he has. Repeating this trope, those in power often engage in both manipulation and wickedness to stay in charge. And this fact permeates the 20th century, the record of events from World War I all the way through recent events in Afghanistan, I think, often depict leaders engaging in conflict, not to liberate people, but for a power grab. And this is just the way things are. But do they have to be? Many of you have probably read by this point that soldiers have discovered evidence of Russian leader Vladimir Putin torturing women and children in the Ukraine. Let's look to see what Psalm says. Psalm 94, 20 to 21. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you? A throne that brings on misery by its decrees? The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. That is what it says in Psalms. And this held true for the Son of God also. Jesus wasn't immune from this. He was tortured, crucified as an innocent, made fun of, humiliated, perhaps the most innocent martyr of all time in all of history. And so I think it's important to keep something in mind here. This is an obvious fact, but I want to uh, emphasize this for, this for a moment. The wicked will kill and destroy. The righteous will fight to edify and protect to edify and protect. Two different ways of living out a leadership role. The first seeks to punish and remove, and it's desperate, and it's fear-mongering. And the second way desires to build up and redeem. Now, I had a, a, a boss years and years ago at another company I worked for, um, and he was a curious gentleman. He's a great big guy, um, and he's, uh, I think I've told this story one or two times anyway, but when he would get angry, his face would change colors and stuff, and he was scary, okay? He was scary. He'd bang his fist on the table, and people would get out of the way, okay? And he would go around to people's desks, and he'd look at your desks and make you open your drawers, and if you had, to, and this is true, if you had too many sheets of paper disorganized, he'd kind of write you up for it, or he'd give you a bad time, and he would use this type of manipulation and fear, and he'd just go around every day and do it. And then we came up uh, with a strategy one day, uh, he did rather, that um, if you got done with your work in time, uh, and you were waiting on someone who wasn't done yet, you could go to their desk and harass them until they got done with their work so that everybody would get to go home early. And these type of things went on and on again and again and again, week after week, to punish and, and, and get that control, right? And so ruthless people, they often rise to power in our culture. And this happens in businesses, schools, even churches. And this is uh, this truth, you know, evil has its day, but it never lasts forever. Hitler had his moment in history and was defeated. Stalin in Russia had his reign for a while. Millions of people lost their lives. And his tenure finally came to an end. Only godly things last forever. Only the edicts and commandments of the Lord have eternal weight to advance the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And furthermore, only churches and organizations built on his foundation will keep a lampstand lit for people. The rest are only distractions. They're here today and gone tomorrow, right? And so the, the example I think of now, um, seeker-friendly churches. If you don't know what a seeker-friendly church is, about 20, 25 years ago, they were really, really big. Okay? And what seeker-friendly churches would do is they would navigate their church services so that they were very, very friendly and approachable to new people, and they put all their time and energy into that, you know, gift baskets and, and follow-up calls and that sort of thing. And when they get people into the churches, there was no prayer, uh, very few, very little scripture. Everything was uh, five ways to succeed in your job, three ways to a better marriage, self-help, that sort of thing. No meat and potatoes. And so they finally started to fizzle out. Okay, that seeker-friendly stuff had its time, and it's on the decline. Here today, 
gone tomorrow, only godly things are eternal. The power of Jesus Christ is incorruptible and eternal. There is no need to manipulate or coerce people into trusting him. That is not how he works. We don't coerce someone into loving something. It doesn't work. We don't coerce someone into loving us. We are free to accept or reject his gift of salvation at any time. It's the exact opposite of how Herod and his family line wielded their power. They moved in the realm of fear and violence. God acts with kindness and compassion. The Bible says that to build the kingdom here on earth, we draw people in through love and kindness. With love and kindness I have drawn thee, not by the sword. Now you will note that the spiritual demonic realm also uses manipulation. It's a power grab also. Lying in various forms of oppression and attack. But make no mistake, the Lord is not weak. He's not weak. Just because he left earth as a silent victim and a lamb doesn't mean he will return that way. The Bible says that when he comes back for the second advent, it will be a terrible and great day. Terrible for those who don't know, don't like Jesus. A great day for those who know Jesus. And we will see his coming in the sky from the east to the west. There will be no way to misinterpret who's in charge at that time. He is in charge. And during this one moment in history, the right person will be in charge once and for all. Sounds good to me, and I hope it does to you as well. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we understand you alone are sovereign, you alone are in charge. We seek your hand not just to protect us, but to redeem us. Let us have the wisdom to exchange love for fear always, always. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.